Hey guys, this is my second interview that I did as part of my research for PC Gaming Chronicles. Robert was heavily involved in computer gaming before the industry was even established, so we've talked not just about wizardry, but some other very interesting and sometimes unexpected topics, such as the first online games, Japanese computers of the 80s, and even Bugs and Bethesda games. Robert has quite an unusual perspective on those events of the past, and his input helped me to better understand this era, so I strongly suggest you to watch this interview, even if you are not a fan of wizardry games. Enjoy. Yes, okay. Well, hello Robert, I'm really glad to see you. Um, before we begin our interview, I want to introduce you to our viewers. Today I'm going to talk with Robert Woodhead, also known as Trevor the Mad Overlord. He is the creator of Wizardry, which is perhaps one of the most influential games in the history of the computer gaming industry. And at the current moment, Robert runs Animigo, one of the oldest distributors of anime and Japanese live action films in North America. Now, Robert, as I briefly explained to you in my email, I'm currently working on a documentary series which aims to give a feel of the early days of the computer gaming industry to our viewers. So my first question is going to be about the Play-Doh. From what I understand, it was a network of computers around the United States that were connected to different mainframes. Play-Doh has introduced a lot of innovations, both in terms of general computer technology and gaming concepts, but its contribution to the industry is often overlooked by the majority. I know that you had a lot of experience with this platform, so can you tell us more about why it was so important? Well, um, Plato uh, was uh, a computer education system uh, that's actually got started uh, in the 1960s, but by the early 1970s, it was a network of hundreds of terminals that were connected to a very large computer, what in those days would uh, it was considered a supercomputer. By modern standards, you had much more power in your phone than this entire supercomputer. But in any case, it was allowing hundreds of people across the country to be online and interacting at the same time. And they developed a very, very innovative display terminal for this system. It had 512 by 512 pixels. It had a touch screen. It had a programmable character set, so you could download basically icons into it. Um, it used a plasma display panel. In fact, they invented the plasma display technology for Plato. And the net result is you had basically a graphics terminal that was just head and shoulders above anything else you know, it wasn't until the late 80s that this sort of um, quality uh, became available, say, on a home computer. And why do you think it Plato didn't continue to evolve and become a mass market product, despite being so vastly superior to what home computers could offer at the time? Um, well, again, it was it was focused on educational software for one thing, and it's just the sort of uh, it it was designed with the environment of the late 1960s and early 1970s the computing environment in mind large central computer terminals spread out all over the place the terminals were pretty smart but they were terminals whereas by the mid 1980s we completely flipped the script because of the invention of the microprocessor. And now we have a distributed network of relatively low powered, but still pretty powerful home computers that then talk to each other. So it's sort of one of these things where 
Um, if the microprocessor hadn't been invented, it might have taken over the world. It would have been the the model, but um, you know, given you know, given the rapid change in the environment, um, you know, it became uh, although it was very influential and and a lot of the things they figured out on Plato then got implemented uh, in, in other environments. Um, you know, it, it, it sort of became a little bit of a dead end from the hardware level. It, just the same way, you know, like in the early days of home computing, we were all using our modems and had BBSs and maybe there was CompuServe. And then 10 years later out of the blue, along comes internet and the World Wide Web and all that stuff is immediately like completely obsolete. Plato was the place where people first figured out how to do a lot of the very basic things that we now take for granted. Um, chatting, news groups, and um, you know, like gr graphical user interfaces, the first attempts at, at those, and in particular, multiplayer games, because Plato was the first place where multiplayer games where people scattered all over the country could play the same game, either cooperating or competing, really happened on any scale and was available and, and visible to a, a lot of people, especially impressionable college students like myself. Yeah. So I and, and quite a few other people in the early computer industry, we were exposed to Plato. We saw some of the games that people had written on Plato and, and some of the things they were doing. And now we have this new toy, this dinky little Apple II, you know? And so obviously our first thought was like, how can we do cool stuff like that that was running on a CDC Cyber 6600 supercomputer on this, dinky little Apple II running at one megahertz. Your first game was actually, first commercial game was Galactic Attack for Apple II. Mm -hmm. That was an adaptation of Empire from Plato, if I understand it correctly. You began also to work on the wizardry while you were still in college, uh, where you met an Andrew Greenberg. So I was just wanted to clarify, was wizardry your first game? that you started to develop or it was uh, something else that to other titles for Plato that we don't know about? Well, my first games were actually for the TRS-80, which was the first computer that I ever owned. And I first started out converting some of the, the standard, you know, early computer games, making sure they ran on the TRS-80. And actually that was the first software package that I ever released uh, professionally, or at least semi-professionally, was a little tape that had uh, 15, the old classic computer games for $15 that I had adapted. Also, um, when I was in college, I, um, I did a dungeon style game for the TRS-80 with, um, uh, it, it it automatically generated mazes, you know, based off of random numbers, and and uh, so so it was a what's I forget the 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 the, the name for that technique has, has escaped me, but uh, a lot of games use it these days where they just like have a seed number and out comes the the map. I, I did I did something like that. Um, uh, so so I I was I, you know I was I was just fooling around trying to do interesting things. Um, the, doing the computer games for the Apple II happened when I had been thrown out of Cornell for a year because of low grades, because yeah. of messing around on computers too much, a story that is not unique to me. Um, and I was doing some software for a business partner of my mother's and after I'd done the serious business software that they needed, I was fooling around and, and started playing around with, with games, um, just, you know, exploring, you know, what can, what can you do when you, uh, when you have a single player 
versus a multiplayer. So you need an AI opponent and how you can work with that. So Galactic Attack was the, the first one of those. And then, and then I started thinking about the same sort of idea, but you know, could we do, what could we do with the dungeon game on the Apple II? Purely by chance, I learned that Andrew, who I also know was a Plato person at Cornell, uh, had been, um, was working on pretty much the same project. Uh, so I went to see him and uh, showed him what I was doing and he showed me what he was doing. And it very quickly became obvious that we both had ideas and abilities that complemented the others. He was still uh, in school um, working on his master's and so he was time limited, but he had a very, very good idea for the, the, the design of the game and, um, and, and the idea of the storyline of the game. And he also had a bunch of friends who were willing to play test it. And I, on the other hand, had, had, had time and I had a, a good handle on how, how you could build the software and get it to fit. Um, so I did most of the programming um, and built the um, database editors and, and other tooling necessary so that they could create the stories that, that worked within the game engine. Before we talk about uh, wizardry, can you, since you owned TRS-80, you probably know that some people uh, gave it a Trash-80 nickname. <laughs> Do you think it was deserved or it's a little over-exaggerated? nickname yeah it's it, it was a perfectly nice machine um it was inexpensive and um you know it had some limitations but all the computers back then had limitations um and you know you know it's the same sort of thing of these days of mac versus pc and the mac users go like you, you only have a pc you know it, it's the same sort of bullshit um You know, computers are tools and, you know, some computers are better for some things and, than others. And, and you use what tools you have available uh, and you pick the best tools you can for a particular job. Like I had the TRS-80 because I was working at a computer store in Ithaca and I wanted to buy an Apple II but my boss would not give me a discount on one because he could sell every, every Apple II he got at full list price. And it was a pretty expensive machine. Yeah, it was a very expensive machine. It was like twice as expensive as the TRS-80. And so one summer when I got home, I found that there was like one Radio Shack. It wasn't even a Radio Shack store. It was like a little hardware store that had a little Radio Shack corner in it in my town and they had one of these TRS 80s and they had no idea how to do it. They, they could barely even turn it on. Um, and they didn't want anything to do with it. And so they basically gave it to me at like almost their cost just so that they could tell their, you know, the radio shack people, yeah, we sold it <laughs> and get well. it out, get it out. So they didn't have to worry about it anymore. So, uh, so I got a TRS 80. Amazing. There is another technical detail that I wanted to clarify is the speed of storage of those early machines. Uh, the first microcomputers didn't have uh, dedicated hard drives and relied on external storage such as magnetic tapes. I've heard a lot about how painfully slow those cassettes were and how it could take up to 15 minutes to load a program in some cases. Uh, can you confirm those claims and how they were comparable in speed to floppies? Was it a significant improvement? Well, floppies are hugely faster, but I mean, the audio, the, basically there were audio tapes. You can think of it as it's just a record. It's like almost like a recording of a modem sound, right? Uh, so it's a similar speed, you know, a couple kilobits a second, maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower. But, you know, when your machine has only got 16 kilobytes of RAM, uh, then what is that? You know, you figure, uh, 
you're getting about 250, 300 bytes a second out of the thing. It doesn't take that long to fill it up. So, and when you, when you consider the alternative, which was retyping in the program by hand each time, uh, yeah. or the, the format that came earlier, like, you know, punched paper tape, Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So as far as we're concerned, you know, you know, recording stuff on audio tape, that was awesome. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it was like, I, also, mean, uh, I almost forgot to ask, uh, those cells, uh, cassettes were producing scratching noises like, uh, the, the X spectrum and Commodore 64, because they, uh, from what I saw, they, uh, usually produce those really, really, well, uh, not pleasant sounds. So it was uh, not as bad when it was, uh, TRS-80 and Apple II, or it was, well, similar. Uh, yeah, it's all square waves. Uh, <laughs> they're just all that cassette output was was just a square wave yeah. um pulse code modulated signal uh, it wasn't anything fancy at all <laughs> yeah it just uh usually it's uh, when we load uh, data on modern computers it's uh, almost uh, we don't notice that and so times and uh, sounds it's usually something that is not uh, well it's hard to imagine for someone who for example uh, never used those computers so yeah i wanted to clarify and wanted to uh, make sure i understand trust, it correctly trust, trust me your grandchildren will look at you and when you tell them oh we only had gigabit download speeds and they will think you were absolute barbarians you know <laughs> Yeah. That how could you possibly survive with only a gigabit per second? <laughs> And another thing that I wanted to clarify technical, it was about basic language. It was it's usually regarded as the language that helped to kickstart the entire home computer industry to make uh, so to help people to make use of their computers. But wizardry was written in Pascal, and I wondered if it made more difficult to port the game on other platforms, since it seems like every single computer on that of that time was had basic by default. Uh, well, maybe I'm I don't understand it correctly, but it looks like everyone was trying to put basic uh, first and foremost on their computers. Well, actually writing the game in Pascal made it hugely easier to port it to different machines. Um, the reason was that, yeah, every computer though back in the day had a basic interpreter built in, but they were all different. Yeah. Um, they all were different, you know, variants and, and they, they all had their idiosyncrasies. But Pascal had a standard P code interpreter because the, the comp everything compiled to this, this interpreted code called P code, which was you know, just basically a, an arbitrary um, virtual machine. Um, and that had two big advantages. First of all, it was very compact. So you could, you could uh, pack a bigger program into less Uh, bytes. I mean, there was no way we could have written a game of the complexity of wizardry um, in basic. It just wouldn't have worked. Um, and the second thing was that, you know, because there's this relatively small P code interpreter, uh, if you can write a P code interpreter for a different machine, then as far as The, the, your program is concerned, it, it doesn't care what machine it's running on so long as that machine has a P-code interpreter. Um, so Wizardry was like 95% Pascal plus 5% um, machine language stuff to, to run the graphics. There was a, basically a, a fairly standard little mini graphics API we'd written that was all written in Assembler. Um, so to get wizardry running on a different machine, you just had a P code interpreter, plus you had to rewrite the assembler, which is uh, code, which was relatively straightforward and boom, um, the, the game's running, um, a lot, uh, of the P code interpreters 
um, were written in Japan because the first first machines really got ported to after the Apple II um, was uh, a bunch of the Japanese machines. Uh, in particular, the uh, the NEC PC9801, which was an MS-DOS machine. From that, we backported that that interpreter for the I, the IBM PC. Um, so now we had it running on the PC. Um, and the, since all of our development tools and were written in Pascal, um, when we, for example, when we wrote Wizardry 4, we didn't write it on an Apple. We wrote it on a PC9801 and we would just boot it up into MS-DOS and you type a command line and suddenly you would see on the 9801, welcome to Apple Pascal. <laughs> because we'd, we'd fooled the machine into thinking that it was a very, very fast um, Apple II. It seems like it required a lot of effort to uh, overcome those technical limitations uh, that uh, early machines had. So a lot of, well, uh, ideas interesting like that. So it, it was another reason why you choose Apple II, like uh, the main platform, because it was the most powerful among those early machines. Well, no, uh, the reason we chose the Apple in, in, in the beginning was that it was basically, this was pretty much before the IBM PC came out. Yeah. Um, uh, and of the, and it was just of the machines that were available at the time, it was not only the most mature, although mature is maybe not the right word for back in those days, yeah. but it was also just the most available and the one that most people had. And it was, you know, the, I the, originally got the Apple II to write the business software for my, my mother's uh, business partner. And the requirements of that software drove the decision to get the Apple II and Apple Pascal. And it, once we had that, you know, uh, when we decided we wanted to, to write games, um, you know, well, we already had that, so why would yeah. we go and buy something different? It's interesting because I've seen uh, sales figures uh, in some of the sources that claims that TRS-80 was a much more popular machine, uh, judging by those numbers. It sold uh, like over half million, uh, at, at least half million of units, while uh, Apple II was uh, still not selling well until the VisiCalc release. And it was in the early 80s, and only then I, they started to pick up. So I was just uh, wondering if this, uh, it, I've seen those contradicting <laughs> info. Well, again, it's, it's not just the raw numbers. It's like, how many people have a computer that's powerful enough to run the kind of game you want to write? The game we wanted to, to write really required a 48K machine. And most of the TRS 80s were 16K or 8K. Uh, so, it, it, you know, you, what, what you find when you look into the history of all these things is that people just basically do the best they can with the things they have available at the time. Um, so a lot, and a lot of things are just um, accidents caused by particular circumstances that in hindsight look like, oh, we were so incredibly smart to figure out that this was uh, the way to do it. When in reality, it's not that way at all. What happens is people just try out different stuff, but you looking at it 30 or 40 years later, you only hear about the stuff that worked. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And you only talk to the people like me who got like incredibly lucky that this goofy thing that we decided to do, which we never expected would, you know, maybe, maybe we might pay back our college loans, you know? Yeah. Um, I know for a fact that that's what Andy Greenberg was hoping would happen for wizardry was that he might be able to pay off his college loans. So he wouldn't have to worry about that. And, um, 
In fact, he, uh, he, he expressed this to me several times. And so like the, it was just like an utter shock to everyone when Wizardry basically did that for him the first month. Yeah, this is actually something that I wanted to ask. Uh, Wizardry, while it was hard and unforgiving game, at, uh, yet it was so much fun to play, so it almost immediately became a major commercial success. Uh, Wizardry games dominated the charts for years, so I couldn't help but to wonder if you and Andrew received any royalties or additional bonuses from those sales. Yeah, well, Andrew um, got a royalty on every copy um and i had a uh equity stake in surtech mm. so we both did pretty well yeah mm. um basically uh wizardry and some of the other things i did in those early days put me in a situation where uh you know i'm not like rich um but i don't I've not had to worry about money and that has given me the freedom to just like try like weird stuff and not worry too much about whether or not it was going to be a success but I just thought it was a good interesting thing to do and you know one of the the strange things about that is that uh, when you don't have that kind of worry about um whether or not something will be a success it's much more likely to be a success yeah um so that's that's how the animego project started it was just a goofy thing to do on weekends um and it wasn't our, it, it was done uh, animego was started by ro adams who was the designer of wizardry 4 and myself as just this fun goofy thing to do because we just thought it was like a fun idea and um our real job was writing computer games and in fact we moved to japan to write on what would have been an mmo um in like the late 80s and that project basically died um and and um so that was a disaster uh, it wasn't anybody's fault that it died it was like um you know that that was the japanese economic bubble popped and and basically we couldn't get funding to continue the project but in the meantime this stupid little fun weekend goofy pointless thing we were doing in the background suddenly like became something and so i've been doing it ever since yeah it's amazing well uh before we i wanted to talk about japan more uh, in detail but before we proceed to this topic i wanted to also clarify a few things about wizardry one thing uh, is related to sales it was uh, what was your stance regarding the computer software piracy back then I've seen that you even made a cameo appearance in Ultima 2 as an NPC who screams copy protect when the player tries to interact with him. So I guess there was ser a serious reason why you were added like, like that to the game. So what was your stance on this issue? Well, back then, like most game developers, I was really upset about software piracy. Um, you know, because it meant that, uh, you know, my opinion was that it cost us sales, which means, you know, less money, which means less money for doing cool, goofy projects. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's also the moral thing of, you know, it's basically stealing. Um, and, and so I put a fair amount of effort into making it more difficult to, um, to copy wizardry and and we didn't actually copy protect wizardry we copy detected it in that um you could you could copy the wizardry discs with any co uh, copy program but we could detect that you had done so um and and it took a while for people to figure out how we did it 
it was it was actually kind of cute um but one of the side effects of us doing that was that I had to learn how the Apple disk drives actually worked. And I have nothing but admiration for Stephen Wozniak. The design of the Apple II disk controller is, is his opus. It is just incredible how much functionality he got out of such a small amount of hardware. I am absolutely in awe. I mean, the Apple II design is pretty incredible. Yeah, and it uh, it proved that because it was uh, among uh, it was uh, first appeared in 1977, but it was produced uh, up to until the early 90s. Uh, unlike the Commodore PET and TRS-80, that uh, gone pretty quick compared to it. Mm -hmm. But but the Apple II was great, but that disc controller board was brilliant. It's I I have. I still tell people about they should they should go and look at how that disc controller board worked, and they will be amazed at what he was able to do. Uh, but in any case, that's getting aside. Um, in the early days, I was pretty I was pretty down on software parts. I didn't like them. I, I just um, I, I just had you know a lot of um, you know ethical objections to the whole thing, which I still do to a certain extent. But one of the things that happens as you get older is you get a little bit more perspective. Um, and so what I've come to realize over the years is that, um, that for somebody who's, who's, who's involved in any sort of creative Thing like software development, writing books, whatever, um, is that the only thing you really care about is your is your paying audience. And pirates, lar uh, by and large, will ne uh, if they can't steal your soft your 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 product, your movie, your book, whatever, they won't buy it. So they're not your audience. So um, I've, I've learned that even though I, I, I may like get a little bit upset when I hear people steal stuff, they're not actually costing anything because they were never customers. They were never going to be customers. Um, the, the, the shorthand version of that is thieves don't buy. So I, these days, I just don't worry about it. I mean, I, I still write software, um, uh, I, I, mostly for my own internal use these days, but there have been a few things over the years that I've, 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 I've just made available. And I don't worry about it anymore. I, I, I usually it's either I put it up on GitHub for free or um, I just say, hey, if you like it, send me some money. I don't care, whatever. Um, and, um, and that, that, so then I, I don't have to worry about it, that, that issue anymore. Another thing that I wanted to ask is what were your connections with Richard Garriott, if there were any at all, uh, the creator, uh, he was the creator of Ultima series. Mm -hmm. And I know that Ultima and Wizardry were not quite the same, but, uh, was there any competition between those games? or any influence that uh, you, well, ideas that you shared with each other? Um, the, uh, we really didn't compete. I mean, back in those days, you know, if you bought Wizardry, you bought Ultima and vice versa, pretty much. Um, you know, it, and, you know, it's not like we were as connected as people are today, you know, um, we were all in our little silos. You know, I was in the middle of upstate New York. <laughs> I was about as far away from the, the center of the computer industry as you could be and still be in the United States. Um, so the only time I would ever see any of these the people who were writing other games would be maybe at a computer, computer convention. 
I, I, I think I've, I've met Richard like two or three times just sort of casually at, at those yeah. things. So I don't think we were ever really competing. I think if we're competing, we're competing with ourselves and in just trying to figure out the best way to implement our particular vision uh, of what we wanted to do. And, and I don't think anybody back then really thought about, oh, I've got to do it better than this guy, or I've got to, um, you know, I, I, I've got to do something that will be better than, than anybody else. It was more of like, uh, what do I want to do and how can I do it? Um, so, yeah, I mean, the only thing I'm jealous about Richard was that he got to go to space and I haven't managed to do that yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I also read that uh, in one of the interviews, Richard claimed that wizardry inspired him to add a similar party-based system in Ultimate Re Exodus. I don't know if you know about it, but yeah, it's look, even though you didn't, uh, well, contact much, he, he definitely looked at your work and yeah, take notes. So... Well, that kind of thing happens all the time. I mean, yeah, this is, is actually something that, that I, um, I, can, I kind of get a little bit um, not, upset is not the right word, but, but a little concerned when people say, oh, Wizardry was so great, you were so brilliant, blah, 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 blah. And when the reality is that every game is sort of a link in a chain. It builds, it builds and adapts on what has come before and kind of remixes it into, you know, using the tools that you have available then. And then other people come along and see what you've done and say, well, I can do that better. Or I like this idea from this game and this idea from that game uh, and this idea from this movie and kind of mixes it all together. And oh, now we have a computer that is got a better graphics. So now I can do this that I couldn't do before. And then they come out with something. So, so you get, and so you get all of this, this is, it, you know, people know about wizardry, but they don't know uh, as much about the games that came before, uh, not just the Play-Doh games, but, um, uh, you know, real life Dungeons and Dragons, which I was a huge, yeah. you know, another reason I got kicked out of co college for a year, <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons. Um, you know, all these things all come together and then you just see this, this final product and then other people see that and it goes on and on and on. And, you know, I've been told that Wizardry was very influential with a lot of the Japanese role-playing games. Okay, but here's the thing. That's sort of an accident. If Wizardry hadn't come out in Japan, okay, um, it wouldn't have had as much influence. If it had happened to be Ultima that had come out, you know, mm -hmm. in uh, Japanese versions uh, earlier, then they would have gone. They would have probably gone off in a completely different direction in terms of their style. Yeah. Okay. So. The reason JRPGs were influenced by wizardry is basically because a complete accident because I cho chose to use Pascal as the development environment, which then made it easier to release the Japanese versions. Okay. And in particular, put them out in Japanese because the, the because we also made the game language independent. Um, and that's, you know, and, and then people look at me and say, well, you're the, you're responsible for this. Because no, I wasn't. The real people who were responsible for that were the, the really talented programmers who did those P-code interpreters on the Japanese machines. And they were led by a guy named uh, Shige Suzuki, who was just, was this absolutely brilliant programmer. And he had a team of guys who were just amazing. Um, and, and they came up with a whole bunch of, things that we then backported into the English versions of the game. Um, and, you know, again, it's, it's just, it's all these contingent things that happen, one triggering another 
that you can't predict and that are often just like complete, you know, you know, rolls of the dice, chance things. You know, when you look at look back at it from forty years uh, from today, looking back forty years, you say, "Oh, wow, they're making all these great decisions." But again, it's just you know, random chance, and you only hear about the the you only hear about the the guys who made who who by complete accident made the right choices. Well, I wanted to ask uh, about the sequels. You had to import characters from the original wizardry in order to play them. Uh, so it was basically making it really difficult to play sequels uh, before you play the original wizardry. So I was wondering, uh, what was was it your idea to make those new scenarios in such fashion? And well, wasn't uh, such a distribution model considered to be a bad idea from business perspective? The honest answer is we did it because it seemed like a good idea at the time and we had no idea if it was a good idea or not. It was just nobody had done a sequel before. <laughs> so yeah. so we, were, we, we were just making it up as we went along, okay? We wanted to do a sequel to Wizardry Uh, Andy had a story. We wanted it to have, you know, bigger, badder monsters and stuff like that, which meant that we had to have high level characters. And it seemed like, you know, the easiest way to do that was just transfer your characters from the previous game. And also that meant that if you played the previous game, you knew how to play wizardry. So we could assume that you knew how to play. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, So, you know, in other words, the, the first Wizardry game was basically the tutorial levels for the later ones. Um, yeah. You know, was that a good idea? I have no idea. It, we didn't, it, it just seemed like the right thing to do at the time. And it, and, and you know, of, of course, you know, somebody will, some people will say it was an idiot decision. Other people will say, oh, but that means that Every time you release a, a sequel, you're um, you're going to get a boost in sales of the first game from new people who've just learned about it. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, I I will let you know other people historians uh, determine whether or not we were smart or idiots. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a combination of the two. <laughs> Yeah, about another crazy idea that you had related to Wizardry is uh, around the time when Wizardry 3 was released, uh, you decided to implement mouse controls and window-based interface, if I'm uh, read it correctly, in those games. Uh, revisit the old games that already were released. And it happened even before the Macintosh computers were released on on Apple II, uh, which uh, <laughs> this is not something that anyone expected, I think, uh, at the time. So was it also just some unexpected idea that you try and thought that it might work well? <laughs> well, around that time, we got a Lisa computer. Uh, yeah. So I got to see the windowed interface and I thought that was really kind of cool. Um, and so as soon as I saw that, I looked at the wizardry interface and go, well, that's absolute shit. I can't, I can't, yeah, this is awful. We, we, yeah. You know, I can't even bear to look at it anymore. Um, so then basically one Friday afternoon, I, I was thinking about it And I suddenly flashed on a disgusting, evil trick that I could do to implement Windows on an Apple II in the game. And um, I, I basically scratched out a few notes on a piece of paper and, and you know, just to make sure that I understood that it would work. And then I started programming it and uh, I didn't sleep until Sunday night, but 
Sunday evening, I had a version of wizardry that was very roughly running the windowed interface. And then I just crashed for almost 24 hours. And basically on Tuesday, I came in and showed it to, to the other people in the company and they thought it was pretty cool. And so um, we, um, um, we, imp uh, we implemented it for Wizardry 3 and then backported it to the other games. And the nice thing was that it required almost no changes. I mean, I, I think it was about a week's worth of work on each of them to get them up and running. Um, because we, we already had a graphics API, it was just a matter of adding a few things to that and, and um, making a few changes to the code to, to tell it when to pop up windows and when not to. Um, and, you know, I, I'm pretty proud of that actually, because it, 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 it was, um, it was uh, a really, it, I admit it, it was sleazy, evil, bad hack, uh, but it worked and, and, um, and it turned out to be really easy to do on pretty much any computer. So um, we were able to, to use it uh, on, the, on the future interfaces. And uh, I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with how that turned out. Well, uh, after Wizardry, you, uh, the, aside from Wizardry, when you were working in Sirtec, uh, the only game that was uh, not related to this franchise was, and that you designed, was Star Maze. It was a space arcade shooter which received favorable reviews, but then you focused again on making another Wizardry game. Was it because Sirtec wanted you to stick with their most successful series uh, rather than see you experimenting with something new, or it was your own decision? Um, I didn't really write Star Maze, I, uh, at least uh, as far as I remember. It's been well, so long. you mentioned as designer, so I was, yeah. Just... I, I, I helped with with some, uh, it, there was another programmer who had the original idea and, and, and did almost all of it. And I just had some ideas on like particular like algorithms and, and ways of doing things to help get it running fast. Um, the, the same thing goes with um, Rescue Raiders. 98% of the programming was, was done by the other programmer. And I just had a couple of bright ideas about how to, how to handle particular problems that he was having with the game. Um, but basically, uh, I just worked on things that I thought were interesting. And it was like, my next project was whatever I thought the most interesting thing to do would be. Um, and, you know, some, uh, and oftentimes that was wizardry, uh, but not always. Well, uh, to conclude uh, my questions about uh, Wizardry, can we talk about a little about uh, Wizardry 4 and why it took so long to release it? Because uh, previous uh, games were, well, they released within one year from each other. Uh, but Wizardry 4, it, was, it had a much longer and seemingly more troubled development cycle. Uh, it took almost four years to release it, which was a significant delay in such a fast-growing market. So can you tell me what exactly went wrong with this game? Uh, we vastly underestimated the amount of work it would take to flip the game um, from being, you know, monster, uh, players fighting monsters to monsters fighting players. The joke in the company, and it's not much, it's not far from the truth, was that at any point in time, uh, I was absolutely convinced that it would be ready next week. And I was absolutely convinced of that for about two years. <laughs> um, it's just like, um, it was the, the game design and what Ro, Ro Adams was a designer of Wizardry 4, what he wanted to do in that game um, about the, the structure of the puzzles and their difficulty in that he wanted the puzzles to be 
incredibly difficult, but also fair in that, um, you know, when you finally figured out one of the one of the puzzles, when you finally got your way through it, you could look back and say, okay, there was nothing in there that was just like stupid. Like everything had a reason. Um, and that took a very long time. And also just a lot of the other aspects of getting the game to work took a long time and getting it to fit took a long time. And it was, um, at any particular point in time, it was like, it was not like we were in hell, development hell. It was just like, we would, we would have a problem and we would solve it and move on to the next problem and then find out that we now had three more problems. <laughs> so the backlog of things we had to do to get the game done just kept getting larger and larger. And um, yeah, th that's, that's just what happens sometimes. I mean, you know, it's not unusual these days for games to be delayed. And we were, I guess we were just ahead of our times. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, yeah. Well, maybe not in the way that you want it, but yeah. Well, so I want to, let's return finally back to Japan topic. Uh, the Wizardry series has been enormous, enormously popular in the West, but it looks like it was on a whole other level in Japan. There are literally dozens of Japanese spin-offs, and there are still new games that keep releasing under the Wizardry brand. And is it true that there were entire local conventions dedicated to Wizardry, and you were treated like a rock star here? Um, well, the joke is that back in the 80s, we nerdy computer programs thought we were going to be like the rock star of the 80s and we'd have groupies and all that sort of stuff. And the truth is, we did have groupies. Unfortunately, they all looked like us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, uh, there, there have been, uh, I've been to a couple of conventions in Japan that, that uh, you know, where I was a guest because of wizardry. Um, Weirdly enough, the Animago company really got a big boost uh, because of one of those conventions. Um, I, I was invited to, to do a computer games convention by the, the uh, CEO of a company called Gynax, which was doing computer games and also was a big animation company. And uh, his name is uh, Toshio Okada. Uh, he's now a big pundit on YouTube. Um, in Japan. But anyway, he said, well, look, come over, do the convention. And um, if you do the convention for me as a favor, I will get you introductions with all of the Japanese animation companies. So you can go talk to them about maybe getting some licenses. This is when we had like one product out for the animation. Um, and so I went to the convention and there are probably some embarrassing photos of, of, of me, you know, doing the, the two fingers thing out there somewhere. Um, and, and then spent the next week going around to all of these animation companies. And Okada also provided me with an interpreter. So I spent the week running around Tokyo with this interpreter. And on Friday evening, after all the business was done, I asked her out on a date. And we're still together. <laughs> so yeah. um, whether or not the animation company had gone off, I, I, I figured that that was a week well spent. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I, 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 I guess, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose part of it is just the novelty of, you know, you know, because I'm I'm not a I'm a American computer nerd as opposed to a Japanese computer nerd, so maybe maybe they think it's a little bit novel. Um, but again, it's it's an accident of you know, of circumstance that that that's the case. And by the way, the best version of Wizardry that, uh, in my opinion, is the uh, the Super Nintendo version 
which I had absolutely nothing to do with. But they they made such a great version of the game. Um, uh, so that just goes to show you that you know I, while I, while I'm proud of what I did, you know I I'm certainly not the best programmer of wizardry out there because the guys who did the, the Super Nintendo version are a lot better than I am. Yeah. Speaking about Japanese market, uh, to con uh, I wanted to ask you about the, maybe you know about local microcomputers such as PC-98, uh, MSX. Mm -hmm. well, of course you know about yeah, yeah. PC-98, MSX, uh, FM7 and others. I mean, it feels like an uncharted territory, uh, but most researchers of that era focused on the console market, which while completely, uh, well, uh, they focused on NAS, uh, Nintendo, but uh, are they completely ignoring the local computer gaming industry. I've been trying to fix that, but it's complicated due to the language barrier. So I wondered if you could give me some important insights about the Japanese computer gaming industry and what of their games I absolutely shouldn't miss. Maybe you know about, maybe you explored this topic back then. I, I really haven't, to be honest, um, because one of the weird things about being in the business back then was that you were so busy writing your own stuff that you didn't really have much time to look at other stuff, um, except casually, you know, you just like see it and say, oh, that's interesting. And and then move on. I mean, there was the, the computer, I think the difference in Japan was that it was just as fragmented as the early um, uh, US days, you know, you had the Apple II, the TRS-80, the color computer, there were all these different, um, different kind of niches. And they, you know, and then of course, in England, you had the, the BBC micro and and, and, so, and the acorn and whatever. Um, in Japan, um, it was kind of like that, but it was all just in this one country and, um, and it kind of lasted longer before things kind of settled down. Um, so, so there was just a lot of very unusual stuff. And also, the the one big difference between the Japan Japanese market and the and the and the um, English language market was the graphics were better because they needed higher resolution graphics in order to do kanji. You you couldn't get away with the you know three twenty by two hundred display, um, or even worse in the case of the Apple II, really in Japan because you couldn't display good kanji on that. Uh, and so that that drove them pretty early on to to be pretty decent graphically, um, certainly better than what was available in the U.S. at the time. Uh, and and so that made for a pretty vibrant game scene because you could just like do more with those machines. I see that you put a lot of effort in bringing anime to North America, but first I wanted to ask if you ever thought about localizing Japanese computer games as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, the situation with English localizations is much better now, but uh, didn't you think about it back in the late eighties to bring those, uh, try to bring those games on Western market, or, or because it was just because Japanese computers weren't so wildly available on Western market? Um, I, it never crossed my mind to think about doing that. Mm. Um, the, looking back at it, I, if somebody had suggested it, I would have said, well, there's some obvious difficulties. Um, the, the graphics is one. I mean, a lot of these games just would not work on an IBM PC level, you know, VGA graphics. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Uh, and also the trend, the the localization. Having done the localization for, uh, from America to Japan, I knew how hard localization was, and that's not something you can do in in your garage on weekends. Whereas the anime stuff, they use the same video format, yeah. NTSC as we did. Uh, so all you got to do is get a master tape of the video and then add subtitles to it. And guess what? We've got computers that can do that. 
so I, I just wrote some uh, simple piece of software that would let us put up subtitles and, and time when they went on and off the screen. And in fact, the software that I use to subtitle Blu-rays today is a direct lineal descendant of that original software. And in fact, the original subtitle script files that I did in 1989 I can just plug them in and generate Blu-ray subtitles. <laughs> Amazing. Well, one thing that I also wanted to ask is about your current gaming interests. Did you check the latest game on the market from time to time or play anything in, in particular, some genres? Or may, I know that you've played EVE online a lot. So mm -hmm. Are you still doing that? No, I... I um... The, there's a saying that you win Eve by quitting. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very time-consuming game. So yeah, I I have it on my account, but I haven't tried it yet because it's yeah, really... um, it, it's a it's Eve is really about the community of Eve players uh, who are just a wonderful bunch of uh, insane people, which is is good because the game is basically written by a bunch of drunken Icelandic computer nerds. Um, uh, I had a great time playing Eve and um, I was actually elected to their player council um, four years in a row uh, and um, which meant I had to go to Iceland a lot uh, which is we, I highly recommend a visit to Iceland it, it's an amazing country uh, and um, it, it, everybody should have it on their bucket list Go see, you know, go, you know, go in the summer and see people going crazy because there are 20 hours of, of sunlight. Go in the winter, see the northern lights. It's, it's just such a cool place. But um, my gaming interests um, are kind of weird in that I ever, just every so often I'll get into a game and play it for a while and then suddenly... I'll be like, uh, okay, I'm burned out on this. Um, uh, you know, the games I played recently, um, I enjoy the Fallout series. Um, yeah, I'm a huge fan too. Yeah. Um, one thing I like to do in those kind of games, if it's possible, is try to implement a computer inside the game. So I tried to implement a computer inside of Fallout 4. And I got really pissed at Bethesda because of bugs in their software that made it impossible to do that. Yeah. It's like, damn you. Um, there, uh, I, 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 I enjoyed Cyberpunk a lot. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to when they come out with some, um, some more DLC on that. Um, the most recent one I got into is called Dyson Sphere Program, which, which is basically a sort of like uh, Factorio on steroids. Yeah. Uh, but no, it's, it's a lovely game and um, I highly recommend it. Um, you, you can waste a lot of hours in that game. Yeah, I'm, I'm personally recently didn't play uh, newest games because I was too focused on uh, playing the oldest one, uh, looking at uh, the stuff that was released in 80s and doing all this research, but I'm going to definitely catch up. <laughs> yes, and thank you for that recommendation because I have also Cyberpunk, but I still haven't played it too much work, it's simply too much. So, yeah, uh, and in our brief exchange via email, you mentioned that you are currently mentoring FIRST Robotics, and uh, mm -hmm. it's another hobby of yours. Uh, and you are, also was, you are also busy with finishing a Kickstarter, a Kickstarter project. I guess it's Metal Skill Panic. Uh, can you tell me more about what you are currently up to? Well, the FIRST Robotics is just, um, you know, I, about 20 years ago, I... I was just a computer nerd and I didn't know one end of a screwdriver from the other, but my kids got really into battle bots. So I had to build them a robot. And so I learned a little bit about mechanical engineering. And so now I'm mentoring high school kids in the first robotics competition, which if, if you're a, a young person who um, 
you know, you're in high school and you, and you, you, you think you'd enjoy programming or, or, or building stuff, then, you know, it's, it's great. You'll learn so much in that. Um, and then our little animation company is still chugging along every couple of years we release, um, you know, uh, a Kickstarter project, which is a limited edition Blu-ray release. The latest one is, is actually the first anime we released was called Metal Skin Panic Maddox 01, which is like a mecha done by a director who went on to become very famous. His name is Aramaki Shinji. Um, but anyway, um, so we, we're, we're, it's currently being replicated right now um, and uh, we should be shipping it out in a few weeks, hopefully. Um, but you know, we, uh, we do like, we, we do these Kickstarter projects because they're a lot of fun and we get to, we get to add a lot of goofy special features to them and, and just enjoy ourselves. Another thing I wanted to ask is, uh, recently we've seen a lot of stories about retired game developers that were active in the eighties, returning back with new projects. One, one of the most recent news is the return of Ken and Roberto Williams, uh, of, mm -hmm. from Sierra who are creating now a Colossal Cave Adventure remake. So have you thought recently about returning back to game development by chance, or is it not something that you are interested in anymore? Um, I would say that it would have to be a project that interests me. I mean, I, 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 I'm very fortunate in that I don't have to work on anything that I don't want to. So, you know, I, at any particular time, I look at what's available and I say, what is the most interesting thing that I would enjoy doing the most? Um, and so if an opportunity came up to, that involved, you know, a computer game project, I would certainly consider it. Um, I would think that at this point it would be more of, you know, kind of a advising or, or design, uh, or consulting arrangement rather than, you know, hacking out the code because that's a young man's game or a young woman's game these days. Um, you know, it's not, I'm, I, I just got back from a first robotics competition this weekend and I'm absolutely wrecked right now. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I literally feel like my extended warranty has just expired and I'm about to collapse. Yeah. Well, well, then I guess I won't keep you any longer. Thank you for taking your time to answer to my questions. And one last thing that I wanted to say was that while I admire your contribution to the history of computer gaming that you did with Wizardry, I also respect you for what you are doing with Animego. Uh, even though I can't say that I'm a huge fan of anime, seeing that after things didn't work out with that Japanese MMO project, you decide to use an opportunity to try yourself in another field that you had an in, in interest in. It's, it's really inspiring for me to see that you keep working on something that you enjoy and it goes reasonably well for you after so many years. Uh, it's just uh, things are compli kind of complicated for me right now, but working on this documentary and talking with different people about this era, it brings me joy. So even if my work would be interesting only for a few nerds like me, I hope I'll be able to keep doing this as long as I can. So I want to thank you again for taking your time to help me to get a better understanding of that era. And uh, I hope that you will have a lot of energy to continue doing what you enjoy doing uh, with your own personal projects. Well, I actually think you have exactly the right attitude to uh, for this kind of thing. I mean, in terms, just in terms of living your life well, um, just like at any point in time, just trying to do the thing that interests you the most, you know, uh, so long as you can, you know, you know keep feeding yourself. Um, any time you spend doing stuff that, that you don't really want to do, 
um, is time wasted and you and you only have a limited amount. We all we all, you know, have just a certain amount of time and we don't know if we have another 20 years or another 20 minutes. So you might as well, you know, do what interests you and 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 what makes you happy. Um, and if you get lucky, then you know everyone will think you're a genius. Um, but even if, oh, like you say, only a few other nerds are interested in it, um, you are interested in it, uh, and and so you uh, so you will have the satisfaction of doing something that interested you. Um, I can t I can tell you from personal experience, there have been a couple times in my life when I've done things, you know, just because I thought, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to enjoy this, but it's going to make such a huge amount of money, you know, um, and they've all been complete disasters. Um, there, you know, there, there's been a couple of anime projects where it's like, uh, I don't really like it, but it's going to be such a huge hit complete bombs whereas opposed to the the things where i said well i really like this but uh, at best it's gonna break even you know but i really like it i want to do it and i go ahead and do that and they some of them not all of them but some of them have been big successes so i guess that what that really means is that 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 your style and your taste and your gut uh you should go with that and um, and worst case, you won't regret it. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Have a, uh, have a good week. Have a good uh, a lot of energy to continue working on your projects. And thanks again for taking your time to answer my questions. You're welcome, sir. And you have a nice day too.